we doing? Good. Looking forward to a great long weekend, I'm sure. And nothing like throwing in a nice training to get things kicked off and the party started for us, right? Uh, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, my name is Dr. Alicia Lewis. I'm the Dean for Student Success and Retention. I oversee a couple of different areas on campus, and I also oversee the student conduct process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that with you today, uh, but I want to focus our energy and attention today on the topic at hand, which is managing distressed and disruptive students. Um, it's no secret that when we talk about whether it's education, public education, or higher education, that we're seeing a lot of students come into these kinds of environments where they bring a whole host of mental challenges, right? We have a lot more students coming onto the campus with psychological disabilities, right? And part of the, the, the challenge is helping to manage those as a campus community, that students with psychological disabilities actually need more support and more resources. This is not about student conduct or reprimand. This is about helping those students be successful. And so part of that experience for you all, because we kind of wear two hats as uh, student employees, is that you are, in fact, employees of the college, but you're also students. And so we have two really separate, distinct processes that happen when a situation of concern happens in the campus community that may be in affecting and impacting you not only as an employee, but also as a student and a participant in the community college environment at Edmonds. Okay? So I'm going to talk about those because we do really need to go through and talk about and discuss role clarification together and talk about the, the, the hats, the various hats that you actually wear as student employees and how to navigate that most effectively and meaningfully for you. Okay? I've, I've had lots of experiences. Um, I have a long background in looking at violence prevention intervention programs. Did some training with the US Department of Justice on self-defense courses on college campuses and making recommendations on how to navigate and negotiate a community college environment, a campus environment where we see a pervasiveness of violence. And when I say violence, often what comes to mind for folks is stranger danger, like someone jumping out of the bushes and attacking someone. Well, we know based on data and research, national data and research, that that's not where the risk is at. The more, the people that are likely to hurt you are people that you know, okay, or that you've just gotten to know. Uh, that's where the risk is at for everyone. And so that sort of shifts our dynamic when we talk about interventions and strategies on how to navigate effectively those kinds of communications with folks that are taking people's choices away or are inadvertently not knowing that they're taking people's choices away. So part of our discussion today is going to be about boundaries, too, and about setting good boundaries uh, and helping you navigate those boundaries. So, um, and I alluded to this earlier, but we've got two expectations that we have to manage. You as employees of the college, right, which comes with its own set of responsibilities, and you as students of the college, which you as students actually have a whole host of due process rights that you enjoy as students here. Being an employee of the college is a little different. Most of you in the room are probably at will employees, right? And this is not to scare you, but really, and it's not, not there's usually good reason and good concern for letting someone go, but there's, there doesn't have to be that lengthy justification that we often see in people getting let go or released from work if something happens where you're on the hook for disruptive behavior, okay? It's, it's a lot less stringent. But if you're a student and you violate the student code of conduct, there is a process that you have to go through, right? And that you have to walk through with the institution that is supposed to be honored, okay? That's part of your due process rights as a student, okay? Um, this is what we're going to talk a little bit about today, expectations and mindset. I like the root ball. When we talk about the root ball, I'll kind of give an illustration of this. This is really getting down into what the real issue is and what the, what the cause for concern is. And it may be multiple things going on with a student that you might be working at with that um, 
is displaying annoying, disruptive, or unsafe and dangerous behaviors. It happens, right? And we're going to talk about those lived experiences here. Uh, navigating those difficult conversations as an employee, a student employee of the college, developing a plan. And the biggest piece of this is part of our campaign of if you see something, say something, is reporting it, asking for help. Okay, and we're going to talk about that, that campaign and talk about what that looks like here momentarily. So when I say root ball, I'm really talking about things that kind of fall underneath something like this. Students are beautiful trees. Employees are beautiful trees, right? We flourish, we grow, we're expansive, right? We take things in, we learn, right? This is beautiful, right? There's a whole set of things that are going on beneath the surface that are also very important. And if we're not acknowledging the stuff that goes along in the surface, we're going to have ourselves a little bit of a problem, right? Yeah. This is a big problem, right? There, there's lots of things. And maybe there's some complexities here and some dynamics that are beyond the scope of your work, that don't fall under the purview as, as other duties as assigned. Okay? And that's why we have the help that we do on the campus. For instance, did you know that we have a counseling and resource center? How many people knew that? Okay? Did you know that we have licensed mental health professionals on this campus? And that, did you know that you can get access to free mental health help on this campus and there's no session limits? Did you know that? It's pretty cool, right? The best part about it is free. You can't beat free, right? We've got lots of different kinds of opportunities for students to get engaged and help, right? And this is just one of many examples, okay? So in order to address the flourishment of our students, we have to address sometimes some of the things that are going on under underneath. And this requires help and assistance. You are not to do this on your own, okay? And we'll talk about why here momentarily, okay? So when I think of behavioral assessment and management, I like to kind of scale it a little bit. This is probably the easiest scale to, to range from, from anywhere from annoying behaviors. How many people have ever had folks in your life that annoy you? Oh, really? <laughs> really? Okay, so we'll talk about how you negotiate that and what comes up for you when someone annoys you, right? What comes up in terms of feelings, emotion, cognition. Then we move into disruptive, right? Now this might be connected to maybe taking some people's choices away, right? What does that look like? You know, how do we negotiate that? And then dangerous, right? It often is the case that if we're not managing the stuff down here from annoying to disruptive, we're not managing it well, we're not setting expectations, we're not putting out good, healthy boundaries, we're not navigating what that looks like. This can, we can move pretty fast from disruptive to dangerous or unsafe, okay? And so when I say boundaries, I think that when we're talking about setting boundaries, a lot, a lot of things get triggered because when I set a boundary, you know, Pat, what you're doing is not making me feel safe. I think I, I need you to stop. Okay, what you're doing is not making me feel safe. Doesn't that feel a little escalating? Like, ooh, I feel like I'm kind of escalating the conversation a little bit and emotions kind of come up, right? Ooh, now my heart rate's kind of going right now. Now I'm kind of getting goosebumps, right? I'm not feeling too good, right? But I'm trying to set a boundary, so I'm doing a couple of things. I'm navigating my cognition and what I need to say, and then I'm trying to regulate my own emotions, which happen, as you know, if you get annoyed or upset, what happens emotionally for you? Call them out. What happens? Ooh, angry. You lose your perspective there? My voice gets louder. Yeah. Yeah. Might get emotional. Emotions travel a lot faster than, than the way that we think, right? So we might be losing sight of a larger perspective here because it's hard in a moment when we're talking about escalating or conflicting behavior to capture it all. That's why we say 20 minutes. Minimum 20 minutes if we're talking about escalation or conflict. You know what, I think I need to step back and, and give myself a break. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you in 20 minutes and then we can come back and talk. So just 
biologically so that I can get my heart rate down and get my adrenaline down and I can get focused and calm and centered so I can come back to someone and approach them properly, right? So think about that. Think about how you manage your own emotions and dynamics when there's conflict, okay? What's interesting here is that there's also a power dynamic, right? We don't, I, this is really important to pay sensitivity to, is that because you're employees of the college, you have power over students. Think about that. Think about the structural power. Right? You're a student, but you're also an employee of the college. So there's a power dynamic that you have to manage there that's important to recognize and acknowledge and be sensitive to. Okay? And I'll elaborate on that momentarily. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Simple, but when we start to disaggregate what these kind of situations may look like, uh, you may have different responses. Okay? So when I think of disruptive behaviors, we'll start here. I think of like, uh, and I used to be in the classroom, so I used to teach a lot of sociology classes. And so part of classroom management and managing the dynamic with, with students was part of the expectations of being an employee, right? And being faculty. So student misuse of technology in the classroom, such as watching loud videos on a laptop or cell phone ringing repeatedly after being told, shut everything down, turn everything off, yeah. Body odor, passing gas, that significantly affects the learning environment. How many people have had this happen? Okay, something to think about and consider. Yeah, let's get real. You know, I like to keep it real up in here. This happens. How do you manage it? Do you not talk about it? Because it's kind of a big deal, right? People might not be aware that they have body odor. Let's talk about it, right? Let's just get into it and talk about it. Right. Excellent, very good, right? If you're being authentic, you're being genuine, right? You're not being disingenuous about it. I like you as a person. I want to see you succeed. Here's how I'm experiencing you. <laughs> That's a not so subtle way of saying things, right? There's also the, the complexity of, the, of this conversation around this campus and our discussions around wearing perfume and wearing cologne and people being very sensitive to that, right? So the flip side of that, part of this discussion is to hold those complexities. There's no right or wrong answer, right? But we, we still have to process with folks that are affecting and impacting the, the teaching and learning environment, right? Whether it's body odor or really strong cologne, you're going to have that conversation. And you're going to strategize maybe with each other about how you approach it, right? OK. Uh, use of alcohol or controlled substances, getting up frequently or kicking others' desks, right? These are all some pretty clear examples of what I would consider disruptive behavior. And at this point, when we're talking about these things, an intervention, a boundary, an expectation <coughs> probably needs to be drawn. But I'm really trying to create a win-win with that person I'm working with, right? I don't want to shame and humiliate. I don't want to isolate anyone. I want to create a relationship of cohesiveness, right? But I'm also setting the expectation. Here's my expectation. OK, I'm being very clear about that. Oftentimes, when we talk about directness, um, people get really uncomfortable with being direct, right? And a lot of this, to be honest with you, is practice, practicing on each other. Right? We did this really kind of, it's cute, but it's actually really effective with, with little kids, you know, uh, um, third and fourth graders. You know, everybody gets a Hershey kiss, right, when we're doing um, um, good uh, interpersonal communication with, with youth. And the, each individual has to ask the other individual, may I have a kiss? Oh, they get very squirmy when they have to ask that question, <laughs> right? But the person on the receiving end of that question gets a choice. No, you may not have my kiss. Thank you. I'm going to eat it right now in front of you. <laughs> or, yes, you may have it, right? So we're, we're getting into this pattern of asking permission and seeking it, seeking permission, granting permission, right? We're, we're talking about the respect of boundaries, right? So it's consent. This is what we're talking about, the socialization of asking and granting permission. 
okay? Because we don't do that. We don't do that at all, okay? But I, I want you to be sensitive to that. That's really important. So these are some good examples of how we set boundaries in order to get that, okay? Let's, let's scale back a little and let's go to disruptive, more disruptive communications, right? These are just some examples here. So frequent interruption of professor while talking and asking non-relevant off-topic questions after being told directly to stop. So a boundary has been set, and now a boundary is being violated. OK, that's not good. That's not good, OK? That's, that's, I'm keying in now. When I, when I have a boundary and expectations that's been set and it's not being honored, we have a problem, OK? It's not good. Repeated crosstalk or carrying on side conversations while the professor is speaking. It very may be in a, in a case like this or whether you're experiencing crosstalking that a boundary hasn't been set. How is someone to know what, what they need to do to correct or remedy their language or their behavior if they're not given the direct guidance to do so? Right? And again, I want you to close the gap and dissonance and think about what that would look like if you were to, if you had to intervene and say, excuse me, you know, this is, I'm, I'm experiencing this and it's, it's really disruptive to me. You know, could we, could you keep it down a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. If someone starts to cry, that feels bad. I had this case before and I basically So a boundary was set and the person started to cry? No, she was, the teacher started to cry because she thought that she was going to fail. Mm. Uh, so I was doing, uh, basically trying to help her, but um, it was not annoying, but it right. was like I knew, knew that she was. Hold that thought. Yeah. Hold that thought. We'll, we'll talk about some of those, the responses to some of those complexities. How many people have experienced that? Where you're something and standing in front of you and they just, they're losing it. They're, they're either getting deeply frustrated or they're, they're, they look like they're in emotional pain. OK, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, yelling at a classmate, instructor, or tutor, that's not OK. We don't do that here at Edmonds. So if that happens, you know, we need to be contacting our direct supervisors to have a conversation about civility and resetting expectations that this is how we work in this center, right? Emotional outbursts or other extreme communications in the waiting room or a campus office that's, that's significantly affecting others, right? We get to have these conversations about how we're being impacted, okay? So there's intent. I did not mean to do this. And then there's impact, which is a little different, right? People may be negatively impacted by a certain behavior or experience or an episode that someone's having, right? It doesn't mean that we are being punishy to that student, but that we're also giving good boundaries, establishing expectations, and perhaps that person needs to get connected to help. Right? That's, again, out of the purview and scope of what you have to offer. Okay? That's why we're here to support, to support your effort. So again, more disruptive communications there. Uh, these are what I consider unsafe and dangerous behavior examples. Okay? So perhaps. A boundary has been set, or it hasn't, even worse, it hasn't been set. Expectations haven't been reset. Uh, someone touching someone without their permission, that's not OK, ever. OK? And I, I just gave a good, clear example of this, that we ask permission, right? We're asking permission. May I have your pen, please? Is it OK if I have your pen? Thank you. Ah, so that was a good exchange, right? Yeah? Okay, so just let me, if I could just borrow that, right? But that's not OK. OK? That's obviously not OK, right? Taking something, oh, is it OK if I take this? Too late, right? I already <laughs> took it, right? So that, that thinking, about, thinking about those boundaries and making sure that they're respected. Physical assault, such as pushing, shoving, punching, obviously not OK, right? These are extreme forms. This is typically what we react to. And we tend to have this dissonance around, dissonance around the triggers that lead up to this, OK? Throwing objects or slamming doors. Obviously not OK, but this may happen. How many people have experienced this before? Yeah. Someone could be going through this. Someone could be having 
as a sidebar, maybe having a psychotic break, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be violent. Right? But they may be doing either repetitive behavior, they may be engaging in this kind of behavior, but that doesn't mean that they're out to harm themselves or other people. They're just perhaps out to harm objects. But it's scary, right? If someone's picking up or throwing down something and you're witnessing that and not knowing what to do with it. Okay? Storming out of the classroom or office when upset, direct, com direct communication of threat. Right? I'm going to kick your ass. If you say that again, I will end you. Those are all pretty clear, direct signs of violence is imminent. OK? Yes. It can be a gesture, right? The puffing up, right? Puffing up, right? So eye contact, puffing up, that's not OK. Right? That, those gestures are, are invoking an act to want to be violent, and that's not okay. Okay? And that's probably a good time to be calling, I don't know, 911, campus security, my office, probably 911 if you're, if you're sensing that violence is imminent, right? As a contrast, going to distracting or annoying behavior examples, this is. How many people have experienced this? A student with a grading personality. Ooh, right? It's less, about, it's less about the student and more about how you're experiencing it and how you're processing and strategizing on how you can work more effectively with them. It's your growth if you're talking about a student with a grading personality. Right? These are fun. This is what makes this work so fun, right? Because not everybody's the same. Right? You get lots of different fun experiences with students that really push and challenge you. Right? They really push and challenge your own growth and how to interpersonally communicate more effectively. Okay? Student that's not prepared or motivated. There might be lots of reasons around this. Okay? And, and typically when we talk about what's occurring outside of the classroom, they're, they're legit. Right, this is, I, I operate under the assumption that every single student here at Edmonds Community College, every one of you is motivated. Right when you walk in the door, you're all motivated. That's where we start. We don't start with, oh, the student is, just came in the door and is totally not motivated. It's a different mindset, isn't it? It's not deficit model. It's strength-based. So if there's something going on, there's, there, there needs to be some different kind of collaboration and coordination with the rest of the campus community to help set that student up for success, right? So every student walking in here, everybody's motivated, everyone, okay? Student uh, tells odd or strange jokes much below the developmental age. Again, lots of reasons for this, too. It's just not on its face and, oh my god, this student needs to be 86 from the campus community, right? There might be some things that we have to manage here in terms of expectation to help that student learn and grow. Okay? Monopolizing staff time, lack of empathy, respecting others. Again, boundaries. Right? We can have a, a conversation about what boundaries may look like. Okay? So here's an example. Chris, in the Learning Support Center, Chris kicks the desk of the student in front of him. He also gets up frequently to engage in some very loud conversations with other students while they are studying. And when he returns, he is often um, he's often snacking on a candy bar, unwrapping noisily, right? The student who sat in front of Chris be, approached a tutor, and the tutor suggests that that other student that was impacted sit elsewhere. So when he sits across the learning support center, the tutor noticed that Chris also moved and sat behind him. What would you do? What would you say? we need to have a direct conversation at this point, right? Because it, it, it's marginaling on, uh, on some bullying here, isn't it? Like maybe some emotional bullying. That's not OK, right? So the boundary needs to kind of be set right away, right? So being very direct at the front, look, this is how the, this student is experiencing you. And you need to stop. This is not OK. We don't do that here, right? Yeah. Well, I was saying, you can also emphasize what the center is for. Good. Right, right. We got a lot of parsing out, right? Food, kicking stuff, 
kicking desks, right? We've got a lot of things that we can separate out, but also create a win-win by talking about what the purpose is there for. Right. We wouldn't want to do that alone, right? We'd probably want to pull in a supervisor and have a conversation about what's witnessed, what's experienced, the intent, the impact, and then begin to document what's going on, right? So that if it happens again with someone else, that we can come back and reflect that back to Chris and say, look, this is how we're experiencing you, right? And of course, we're having those conversations in private, right? So that we can help cultivate that win-win. Yeah. Um, what do we need as far as documentation? Documentation, um, I'm not asking for a huge report. You know, I'm, I, and I, I don't think that's the expectation of the Learning Support Center. I think it's just, you know, a, a couple sentences, a paragraph of what you witnessed and experienced and what the remedy was, right? What the intervention was. So you write it up to Yeah, right, so that we're tracking, so that we can help. So it's not about holding students down and punishing them again. It's about being able to address and remedy the behavior early and often, okay? So what about for you? Think about this instance. Put yourself in, in this scenario and think about some of these questions, OK? If I can go. What bothered you most about that situation? If you, if you think about the kinds of behaviors that Chris was engaging in, what bothered you most? These are very great cognitive responses. You are all very very cerebral right now, which is great. But what feelings get attached of, of mentioning some of those things? Angry. Angry, okay. Fear. F some fear, being scared. Anybody scared? Okay, what, concern. Some confusion. Wanting to find out more, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how do we predict out some of those emotional responses and behavior from Chris? Because once you confront, right, it's going to feel like you're escalating. It's going to feel conflictual, right? So how can, we, how can we confront it? How do we, what kind of behaviors, if we're talking about being defensive, how can we predict some of those behaviors out so that we can have a meaningful conversation with Chris? Good. I'm going to take your perspective. What is your name? Young man. James. James. James, I'm Chris, right? And you all are Pat. <laughs> hey? Oh, man, shit. All you do is complain. All you're doing is complaining about me. You got four things you got to complain about. You know, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to live in here. What's up with that? I feel like you're targeting me. Right? Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great, but I feel like I'm being targeted right now. You, you're, you all are targeting me. I'm just trying to do my work in here. I'm just trying to, you know, be and get help. Come on. Okay, great. Good question. Okay. Okay. If you have reasonable suspicion that someone is under the influence because they reek of alcohol or they're inebriated in some way, visibly inebriated some way, you need to contact campus security. Okay. Right. Hey, I'm, I'm on the defensive, right? And I like your approach. You know what? Just step back. This, this is how people here are experiencing you, right? We want to make this a win-win, but this is, how people, this is how people are experiencing you. You have any thoughts to that? So right now, I'm, you're, you're going to have to control for my shame and humiliation, right? If, if I'm on the receiving end of being reported. How do you do that? 
I would be asking a lot of questions, but not accusatory questions, curiosity questions. What kind of questions could you ask me at this point? Psh. Go ahead, ask me. Yep. Do you, do you know how much noise you're, pack, you're packaging when you, when you open up that box of cookies and it's in that packaging and it's cellophane and you rip it and you tear it and it's ring? Do you know how much noise that makes? No. What else? <laughs> Good. Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm worried about you now. Oh, <gasps> yeah. Got in a fight with my dad today. Ah. Ooh. Oh, you are. Oh, you are good. Yeah. How does that make? Are, are you okay? Do you need to talk with someone? Yeah, hey, let's walk down to counseling services. I know someone down there. Right? And it's free. <laughs> you can't beat free. S asking questions, right? But we're asking a lot of inquiry-based questions, not <laughs> accusatory, not yes or no, but ways for students who, who may be defensive, ways for them to respond. Softball. Softball questions. You're trying to build trust and rapport, and at the same time, you're trying to address the behavior. Look, I just want to level with you, James, okay? The, the way that people are experiencing you is not good, and I, I want to help you. Right? Let's just level with each other right now, right? Good, good questions. Great questions, yeah. It, it may be, and it may be more appropriate for Pat to ask those questions and not you, right? Well, yeah, she has more power. Jeremiah has more power, right? So we may have more of a facilitated discussion, but we've got to come from an angle of trust building, right? And then resetting expectations. And if it happens again, then we've got a problem, right? It means that boundaries are not being respected. Okay, so think through that a little bit. Conflict is good, actually. A lot of people don't think conflict is good. I think it's great. But it's how you navigate and negotiate that conflict that makes you a better professional, makes you a better person, it makes you a better student, being able to navigate and learn from and grow from those experiences of conflict in a safe way. Right, we've got a safe container to do that. This is a great place to do that because you've got a lot of authority support to bring to Pat and Jeremiah and staff to be able to render those conversations in a safe way, effective way. Right? Like I said, you can't do it alone. Okay? So those are, th this is very good. You, you came up with some great examples. This is what typically you know, people are bothered by when we talk overall rude behavior, the fact that your suggestion didn't work and Chris repeated the behavior, perhaps. The fact that Chris is disrupting class or the tutoring support center through small means. You can't just kick Chris out of, the, uh, of a class or the tutoring center necessarily, right? I, for example, I, I hear this quite a bit on campus, and it's a, a continued conversation. You cannot kick a student off campus, right? You can kick someone out for the day, right? You can kick someone out for the day. They have to be invited back. You can't say you are banned from the Learning Support Center. Can't do that, right? This is an educational space. Students have due process rights to be here. So if they're being disruptive, you can kick them out for the day. And when they return the next day, you're having a conversation and you're resetting expectations, right? So take a chill pill today. Go get centered. Come back tomorrow and let's talk and debrief, OK? So if that person comes back, hey, I just wanted to have a follow-up conversation with you about this, right? And I like to see things in writing and in email. So what I do typically with students is I will forward an email. It was great talking with you today. I just wanted to talk about what we brief, briefly summarized what we talked about today. This behavior is not OK. Please don't do it again. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to he be here to assist and support you. And then you can BCC or blind copy your supervisor on it, right? 
that's an approach so that we can track and help, okay? Okay. Why oh, the keyboard's not working? Here are some tips, helpful tips as we're talking about working with setting expectations for the classroom or site visit, whatever. Publish and discuss expectations. We have a civility code on the campus, and I'm happy to forward that to Pat and Jeremiah so that you all can take a look at that. It's the code. It's what we do, right? We treat people with civility on the campus. So talking about that if things come up allows for a discussion around what civility means to folks, OK? And if they're feeling like they're being treated disrespectfully or they're feeling targeted in some way, we can have a discussion about that. Okay? Including a discussion about what happens if someone violates the expectations. Typically, these kinds of conversations need to happen in private with a supervisor. Okay? Uh, being called out on obvious behaviors in a public arena is shaming and humiliating, and it triggers anger for people. How many people have ever been shamed or humiliated before in their life? What's the next emotion you typically go to? Anger. Defense. Defense. Frustration. Frustration. Sadness. Shutting down, right? The root ball of it is shame and humiliation. So we need to be mindful of that and respectful of that and compassionate towards that because no one likes to be shamed or humiliated, OK? There may be some things that students walk into the Learning Support Center with that they can't control, right? Someone with Tourette's, someone that's, that's yelling out cuss words, right? That's very disruptive, but that this person can't control that, right? So we need to come at them at an, ang an angle of compassion, OK? What can we do to be help that person be successful, OK? Discuss how the students will interact with each other as well as the instructor, staff, your relationship, staff with the learning, lear, within the Learning Support Center. That's important because you're trying to maintain relationships too with students. You want people to flourish here, I would assume, correct? Yeah, yeah. So how do we, how do we cultivate that? And the best way to do that is in collaboration with supervisors, OK? How about this one? Check it out. Sally is a second year student government leader who seemed a little off her first tutoring session that she has with you. Right? As a tutor, you talked with her and she said that she was just not, she was feeling under the weather. She wasn't feeling very good. Okay? The next day she comes to the learning support center and she smells like marijuana. She appears to be fine. A week later, Sally comes to meet with you to discuss an upcoming assignment. She sets her bag down next to you both and the bag accidentally tips over. A small bottle of vodka falls out of the purse. What do you do? It's a tough nexus to be in, especially as a student employee. And, and along that vein, I would argue that we on this campus are attempting to, to try to build a culture of reporting. That if we see something just not right, not sitting with us right, I think our natural, our natural feeling is that's not my problem, right? That this is the role that I'm in. This is something that I should probably not deal with, right? Because it's very personal, right? <coughs> we, are, we are wanting to connect those students that are in pain, that are experiencing injustice, that are experiencing perhaps something illegal going on connected to resources, right? There's all sorts of stuff here that you could probably deconstruct and unpack as a licensed mental health professional, right? But on its face, as I'm experiencing this, I would be having some very quick questions to ask Sally. Are you OK? I'm, you know, I'm really concerned about you. What, what is going on? Right? You're not going to sit there and have a therapy session for four hours with this student. You are going to draw a boundary and say, you know what? Let's walk down to Counseling and Resource Center. I know someone down there. Let me go grab Pat. Let me go grab Jeremiah. And let's walk down together because we, are, we care about you. We're really concerned about your health and well-being 
on this campus. And every student deserves to be healthy and happy on this campus. And we have the resources to help you. You are a resource connector. You are not a therapist, OK? So you are out there trying to connect resources to students. That is your role, OK? Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? I saw a hand up. Yes? Um, maybe this is a little bit, and it has got to be a better way to do it. And that's not really okay. Because I'm thinking Chris has been decisive with you and Sally the first years. Oh, yeah. You, we're also talking about two very different contextual experiences, right? You know that, but when, you're, when we're talking about these things as they're taking place, this is a very contextually different experience than what I showed you with Chris. Okay, so we, our questions may render the same, but they may also have different outcomes because we've got a different context on it. And there may be some things that are actually really toxic that your, your role is not to hear those things and to process, process through them with, with students that are experiencing that level of toxicity, OK? But it's, it's more to get them, you know what? Let me just check in with you as you're talking with me right now. I have a sense that you're really, that you're really scared. And I just want to say, let, let's just go. Let's go to the Counseling and Resource Center and let's see. That's a good way to sort of augment the conversation to resources, right? Let me just stop you right there. Let me just check in, OK? I'm getting the sense that, that there's a lot, a lot going on in your life right now. And I'm concerned. And I'm scared. So let's get you connected to resources. Does that make sense? And not like the better you report it, the person the more likely they're actually going to take it. Likely, yes. Yeah. Right. And you may not have the answers, right? When we get into these conversations around privacy and confidentiality, privacy is a very different conversation than confidentiality, right? Is this conversation going to be confidential? Absolutely not. There's only a very few number of folks in the world that hold confidentiality. Lawyers, clergy people, and licensed mental health professionals. You do not hold confidentiality. And you, don't, you don't even, can't even guarantee privacy, right? Because if someone reports something to you, especially if we're talking about alcohol, drugs, abuse, right? Whether it's sex abuse, physical abuse, right? All of these things are a violation of our policies, our college policies, and they may be a violation of the law. So we don't report. This is, it's not a personal conversation, right? When someone shares something with me, it is not between, hey, between you and me, sorry, in my role as a college employee, I am mandated to report, OK? In my role as a college employee, I am mandated to report. And part of our role as college employees is to help students navigate the system, because it's complicated. It's not easy. We don't make things very easy at Edmonds Community College. We try, and we're working on it. But it's not easy sometimes to navigate the system, especially if you have a layer of toxicity or a couple of layers that you're trying to work through, right? Cognition and those kinds of things kind of go right out the window, right? So to ask a student, hey, you know what? Let's get you connected to counseling services. Here's the number. Go walk down there. The chances of a student being able to make it down there is slim to none, right? I am walking and talking with that student as I'm walking them down. And it's up to them when they want to make the appointment, if they want to make the appointment. But I, at least I'm walking them to the resource. Okay, I'm walking them to get connected to the resource. I'm walking them to your office. I'm walking them to your office. Right? We are walking and talking and modeling behavior. Okay. Yeah. Where is it? Counseling and Resource Center is in at Mount Lake Terrace. It is next to the SSD, and it's connected to the Career Action Center. So if you were to walk through the double doors where the coffee stand is, you hang a right. There's the Career Action Center. You hang another right. You hang a left. Then you hang another left. And the, career, the Counseling and Resource Center is back, back in that area, MLT. Uh, just a couple of things that may bother you most about this experience. The fact that Sally would meet with you after she was drinking, perhaps, if she was drinking. 
uh, that talking to students about their drug alcohol issues isn't in your job description. <laughs> There's probably other reasons what's, what's going on here, right? Even though pot is legal in the state of Washington, if we're talking about the use of pot, it is not to be used on college campuses. It is a, it, it is a federal violation for us. It's, we are bound by, obviously, we get money from the feds. This is still a, a hot topic for discussion. It is not permitted. It is strictly prohibited to smoke pot on our campus, OK? So unless, unless we're getting into the conversation about having a medical ID card, even then, we are still strictly prohibited, prohibitive to have pot on the, on the college campus, OK? Uh, the Sally is a student leader and makes bad decisions. This often comes up with folks. Like, this, these are really bad decisions. You know what? These might be coping strategies, though. She might be coping on something that you're not fully privy to, nor should you unlock or unravel. But there might be some context here that you're not aware of, right? That you are worried about Sally since she told you there is a history of alcoholism in her family, right? She might be co coping with something traumatic, right? Not questions I'm going to typically ask someone if I'm a tutor, but I may be do just doing some probing and checking in, inquiry. Hey, are you OK? You know, this wasn't our, like our conversation the other day, so I just wanted, I wanted to check in with you. Just make sure you're OK. If they say, yeah, I'm fine, great, right? We make sure that there's some congruency with behavior, action, and words, too, OK? Some helpful tips when we talk about situations like this. Um, talking to the student alone, not in, in, out in public and asking those questions, hey, are you OK? Right? And it, it's likely the case that you're going to need to bring in Pat or Jeremiah into the mix when we're talking about this, especially if you're witnessing uh, or observing behavior that that's, doesn't feel right, right? that feels inconsistent. Right? You're going to want to bring in a supervisor. Um, talk should be free of time pressure, typically. right? Hey, I only got 30 seconds. I just wanted to check in with you. Are you OK? Go. <laughs> right? No. Right? <laughs> Not OK. Right? Uh, seek to understand, not to judge. Right? There's a lot of things up there that could predicate judging. And that's not OK. No one likes to be judged. Right? This is about suspending your judgments and trying to understand what's going on so that you can offer up health. And I guarantee you that people that feel judged are not going to open up to you. And they're not going to convey what they need. Right? They're going to be pretty quiet. Like, if I looked at you and said, are you OK? What's this? A bottle of alcohol? You do that? What's, what's going on with you? What's wrong with you? Mm -mm, right? Not the kind of questions we want to ask. OK, there's, there's a better way of getting at it. Discuss with neutral tone, no sarcasm. Oh, alcohol, yeah, parte. What's going on with you? Not good, OK? Building connection, working together, finding teachable moments with the student as well, right? But again, there might be some things here that are outside of your control, outside of the scope of your duties and responsibilities, to the likes of which we want you to report, right? This is about getting Sally the help that she needs, OK? And in all honesty, if, if there's alcohol and drugs going on, this isn't necessarily, and I say this with context, necessarily about student adjudication. This person might need some, some serious help. There might be some things that are going on that are, that are illegal, right? that are criminal, that I'm not privy to or aware of unless I'm having very direct questions in, in a student adjudication meeting, but that we're parsing that out on situations of concern. right? That is not within your duty and responsibility as an employee of the college. That's mine, OK? So being clear about that, that's important. Uh, some tips, additional tips. Know what constitutes significant disruption. And part of this is building up, building up that cognition and understanding some of the, the key stereotypes or the characteristics that we talked about earlier, right? Some of those are very stereotypical. Right? 
So as we're walking through this process and we're thinking about annoying, disruptive, and unsafe or dangerous kinds of behaviors, think about your own experiences. Think about things that may come to you as a way of being able to, in your mind, strategize with, oops, <laughs> strategize with uh, your peers and with your supervisors about how best to manage the situation, okay? Sometimes in, in when people are taking classes, they, you know, we got syllabus, that syllabus is a contract. So pull it out. Have a conversation with, let's take a look at the syllabus. Let's see what's in there. Those are the expectations, that is the contract that faculty have assigned for a class. When students sign up for a class, that's with the terms that you're agreeing to. So it's always nice to come back and, and take a look at those. Use students' names, develop a relationship. Do not assume that every A student is not dangerous and that failing students won't comply. It's actually, the, according to the research, this is the opposite of this, right? So we need to be talking about how we can best help everyone, and especially those students that are conveying concerning or disruptive behavior. We need, they need help, right? They don't need to be reprimanded. They need additional help and additional resources. Uh, talk to your supervisor if needed. Call the dean. That's me. If you need guidance, if you need consultation and collaboration with your supervisors, let's talk it through. I get maybe four or five phone calls a week from faculty of saying, all right, here's the scenario, here's the situation, I need help processing this out and let's talk about it, right? So we're just kind of processing through the what ifs and strategizing together. That's a very effective way of, of coming up with choices and opportunities too for students, okay? Don't assume the problem will go away. This is what gets my goat every single time. Right, is that boundaries are not clearly delineated. Again, when we set a boundary, it feels very confrontational perhaps to us or that we're getting triggered in some way. Paying mind to those emotions and practicing setting a boundary. We're going to practice today a little bit, okay? And you have to do it without a smile on your face. Okay, that, that, that's, the, that's the difficult part, right? And we'll do a little example building here in a minute. So don't let situations build. Address the lowest level issue before it escalates. So I have an issue back here in fall quarter, and then all of a sudden things get really explosive in the, at the end of winter quarter during finals, and there were issues that could have been remedied back here at fall quarter, right? The boundaries were not set, right? And it's not blaming the people that didn't set the boundaries, but it's Hindsight's always 2020. Going back and taking a look about how we can set meaningful and effective boundaries so that students have a way to negotiate them. Okay? It's healthy. Boundaries are good. They're healthy. Right? Structure is good sometimes. It's healthy. I want us to practice um, the language of setting a boundary. Okay? And you're going to do this with someone that you feel most comfortable doing that with. And that makes it even more challenging with it when it's someone that you're most comfortable with. Um, we're going to practice this, OK? Practice is, I think, crucial. It is. It's, it's really, you know, a lot of, we've never had experience sort of setting those boundaries in yeah. a conscious way. Yeah. I mean, we're setting boundaries all the time, but not right. with consciousness. So. Right. Thank you so You're welcome. much. You're welcome. Um, I already have a theme for next quarter, for spring quarter, for <laughs> Dr. Lewis to come and, yeah. and work on that one, too. So uh, thank you very, very much, thank everybody, you. for coming. And thank, thank you. you. Alicia. Thank you. Thank you.